Some of you don't know Deborah. She um, works for Microsoft Cortana and is really responsible for designing the personality of that digital assistant. And today we're going to try and have a discussion to see how she thinks about designing personality and, and why that's actually important in um, creating virtual assistants that we actually really love, as we've seen with X.AI. So um, to start off the discussion, I wanted to um, just add some context around, um, around what we're going to talk about by essentially asking you to run through, you know, why are you developing Cortana? Um, how is it designed, um, and uh, what's this reason for being, really? Sure. Um, so uh, Cortana is, is a digital assistant on the Microsoft platform, and um, it, she's there to be your, we, you know, other people have mentioned already this, this notion of a digital personal assistant and the interplay between, you know, what was it, inner, inner IA and AI. Um, Cortana is there to help, and I liked what somebody said earlier about the democratization, um, the idea that, uh, that there's an interface on your, on your phone or your device that gives you the opportunity to not only have easy access to the stuff that you want to do and give you a way to, um, to interact naturally, uh, but also to kind of, um, if not humanize, then sort of socialize the interaction that you have with your computer and your yeah. device. Um, what were some of the other? So it's, so it's really trying to just reimagine the way that um, humans are interacting with machines, essentially. Exactly. Yeah, we have we have the inner interfaces already with with typing and to a certain extent with speech. There's been yeah. accessible speech for almost since the beginning. Um, but like somebody was saying out there, that uh, the accessible speech is much more about um, you know nailing that exact. Uh, set of templated words that that sure. allow you to interact in a particular way. It's not based on conversational understanding yeah. or natural language, and not. And when we say conversational understanding or natural language, what we're really looking for is the ability to talk as if you would talk. Yeah. You don't, so you don't have to do a translation in your mind to think, how do I speak computer yeah. in order to make something happen? Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the areas that I think is particularly um, interesting in the space is, um, is really what are the hurdles to, to mass adoption? So what's really going to make every one of us in this room who are techies and, and love this kind of work um, to use a virtual assistant and really depend on it? And what's going to make the people outside of this room uh, want to depend on it? Um, so, you know, before we had this chat, we spoke on the phone about a couple um, areas that you think are important for, for generating mass adoption. One of them is, uh, is the concept of personality. Yeah. So um, do you want to talk to us a little bit about how you think about that and yeah. why you think it's really important? Absolutely. So um, um, there, there are a variety of reasons why personality can be useful. And, um, and the fellow who was just speaking before got into a lot of that, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking later. So what we know about computers, right, is that if you don't, uh, if, if we don't give a personality to something um, where you're interacting, then people do. People bring their, their sense of anthropomorphism or, or at least personality to the, to the table. So um, we made a bet really early on that if, if that was going to happen anyway, then, uh, then perhaps we could shape what we want that to look like. Now, that was a somewhat... Um, uh, Siri existed at that point, but there, there wasn't, like you say, a lot of mass adoption outside of Siri. Um, there wasn't Alexa yet. And so yeah. uh, for us, it felt like a bit of a gamble at the time. Uh, but we felt really strongly that if we could um, not only craft a mechanism to uh, make people feel as if what they wanted to see say or do felt natural, but that we could offer um, uh, sort of uh, uh, help to grease the wheels, to, to, yeah. to bring you along and help you feel comfortable and, and hold your hand, um, that that would, that would help um, sort of shortcut some of the, the, yeah. the sensation of, of disconnect or sort of, I don't know what to do or where do I start. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, there's there's a, a decent amount of research out there saying that there's um, uh, that an, an, an ambiguous or sort of wishy washy personality is is pretty unpleasant to everybody that you really can't cre create something that is all things to all people. Yeah. Uh, and so if that's the case, then you get to start putting stakes in the ground and say, well, what do I want? 
my uh, my digital assistant's personality to accomplish. Yeah. And when you start with that, you start thinking, uh, you know, well, there's there are the factors of, of what we can do, and then there's where we want to get, where we yeah. want the interaction to go, so that. Um, so that as we achieve greater and greater technical ability, um, people are going to be there with us along the way. Yeah, so, so you touched on a really crucial point there, I think, um, and that's that personality is important for um, building trust with, with an agent um, so, that, so that you feel that you can rely on it important exactly. points, but also that it's, um, it's actually nursing the user along so that it understands, so that he or she understands what the agent can and can't do. Precisely. Um, especially when in 2008, um, you know, the iPhone came out and Siri was there and people didn't really know what it could do. You know, it was just asking questions like, what's the weather? What's the football sports, and then returning some some witty responses, and so um, so how, how do you think about um, how you use the personality to educate the user as to what the agent can and can't do as the technology evolves and can enable increasingly complex um, queries to be answered? Yeah, absolutely. So there's um, the trust is a huge factor, right? That's a that's a massive watchword for us. So um, what goes into trust? So there's there's consistency, right? So that you 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 establish a pattern and then you behave uh, in a way that's consistent with that pattern, yeah, so that yeah. people can habituate to what yeah. you've what you've set out. Yeah. Um, there's transparency, right? So um, you know we we made this a similar um, a similar uh, stake that that Cortana is really self-aware that she's AI, and that yeah. gives us the opportunity when you come up against something that either where she doesn't understand you or if you don't understand her, or if you run into a, um, <clears throat> a a spot where there's some friction, she can be transparent about what her capabilities are. Mm. That uh, that helps create um, more trust in the future, hopefully, that um, that when you're getting it right, you're getting it right on purpose, and that yeah. if we give you the uh, guidance to um, to do things a particular way or try and point you in a particular direction, that you would have some confidence that that we know what yeah. we're talking about. We could, um, I, I put together just a couple of screenshots of Cortana. If, if you could, um, I did one where, oh shoot, let's see. Oh, I can see down here. Yeah, okay, so here. So she, she knows what she is. She's, um, she knows she's not alive. She knows she's AI. Um, so in, when you get into the situation, these are all chit-chat screens, so these, are the, the, um, the, these aren't task-based scenarios. These are the kind where people are just sort of kicking the tires and seeing what she's going to say, right? Um, but even here, we try and be really careful to, to carefully... Um, uh, you know, we're creating a fictional world, right? Mm. Where Cortana exists and has thoughts and personalities and pastimes and tastes and so forth. But we're really careful when we do that to make sure that they are in line with what someone would expect of a self-aware AI, yeah. um, you know, digital assistant who's there for you. So we're, if, if we're in a situation where she's, you're asking her how she passes the time, we try not to give her some... Uh, some indication that she's passing the time by doing stuff that would distract from her yeah. paying so, attention to you. So how did you go about that process of, of user research to figure out what what somebody would expect an AI agent um, you know, to feel like and, and to sound like? Because I'm sure that depends you know, very significantly on the culture of the end user, sure. whether, they're, you know, whether they're American or French or English, whether they speak another language, or they don't know what AI is at all, or their new Microsoft user. Like, how do you? What does that process look like? Yeah, what did you absolutely. Learn absolutely. So, so you you touch on two two great points, and one is the the sort of the building of the personality pillar, and then the other is how does it perpetuate, yeah, exactly. you know, into other into other markets. And so yeah. we started in English, we started in United <laughs> States, and and we started with our core team of people. And yes, we looked at a lot of we looked at a lot of digital assistants in the fictional universe, yeah. you know. Jarvis and and also we we went and looked at um, how digital assistant or sorry how personal assistants interact yeah. with actual human people who need 
personal assistants and, yeah. and what they do and, um, and some of those intersections. But, you know, we also looked at what we want people to be able to accomplish on, at that time, it was just the phone. And mm-hmm. so in, in the intersection of all those points, we would sort of craft them together. But uh, uh, a lot of it was, um, to some extent, trial and error as we began to think of how did, what did, you know, we looked at Cliff Nass and the, um, the other research around um, people's interaction with it. Have you guys read The Man Who Lied to His Laptop and those ones? Um, well, anyway, they're <laughs> the, the books about how people behave with their computers. So we looked at that kind of information and, and how, um, how people have done studies to, to determine that. But a lot of it really was on the ground work as we, as we first began looking at, well, if we want people to feel trust, then we need to be trustworthy. Well, what does that look like? How do we... Um, then uh, and then sort of walked it back from there, um, and I'm I'm realizing that if I don't stop, I might but, go uh, way into that. <laughs> so, so on the, on the um, on the trust angle, is it just about being clear to the user what what Cortana does and doesn't know, and then showing some kind of probability um, that it backs up its statements, or is it, is uh, it does and doesn't know? No, because it's more it's more in. It's figured out in the in the task itself. So, for example, if you're walking somebody down, um, creating a, a reminder, you know, so re- Cortana remind me to do a thing. Mm-hmm. Well, there are variables involved in in creating a reminder. So, what time is it? A place? Is it a person based? Did we understand what you said? Did mm-hmm. we um, did did we understand part of what you said or or anything? And so. We we take uh, when we're when we're looking at those processes, we uh, we build out the different probabilities of, of possible um, outcomes. you know outcomes exactly, and then at each stage. So this is where I come in. Sorry, um, uh, we look at how do we want to communicate what we need to know from you. So so yeah. there are ways that we could say you know unknown or unheard or whatever. Or we could say, "I'm so sorry. I really didn't understand that. Can you say it again?" If in the the, the former has no natural language communication, the latter you would get bored to tears and turn her off, especially mm-hmm. if you had to listen to her. Um, and there's also an element of sort of overcompensating. If she says, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm such an idiot," then you're putting her in the position where you're feeling bad for her. Like you're you're the jerk who made her feel bad, and we don't want people to feel that either. And so there's a there's a crafting of the efficient amount of information to convey what we need to know from you in a way that that feels natural but doesn't take up your time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, a lot of these notions of, uh, of personality are very qualitative. Um, and so I'm curious about, um, you know, how you measure their effectiveness. How, how, do you, how do you measure the fact that, you know, you've, um, you've decided that Cortana should be polite and kind and transparent? The way that that actually manifests to the user, um, are there any metrics that, that, that lie behind it that you can use to optimize um, the interactions with users over time? Or is it a case of doing a lot of qualitative interviews? It is people? mostly qualitative in, the, in that respect. But they, we do, you know, we certainly do research and we and we look into how people, yeah. but like you say, there's, there. this is, you know, I've been a writer for, I don't I was counting the other day, 16 years or something ridiculous. Yeah. And, um, and writing is not a data, <laughs> we just often don't have a lot of data on um, exactly which part of the words we say moves the dial specifically yeah. right. But we do know what people ask. And yeah. so we know when people don't succeed or when they have to ask it six times. Or we have a lot of, uh, we know what people <laughs> ask Cortana for um, chit chat so we get real insight into human mm. nature and the we get um, educated yeah. in an urban dictionary about all kinds of different <laughs> things that I didn't necessarily know. Yeah, I bet there's a lot of anonymized research you could put, you could publish on like what people, people are, are thinking. People like, feel very <laughs> comfortable yeah. talking freely to Cortana. Yeah. I bet. And so is that a good transition to talk, to run through some of the witty responses? Do you have some Oh, about yeah. That? Well, it's, we have a look? I had just a few... Um, but the, part of what I wanted to say was that, yeah, we try to be funny, but f- funny's, first of all, funny's hard, right? I mean, funny's hard anyway. That's why not everybody is funny. Yeah. And, um, 
and we do uh, all the all the writers on the editorial team come from a creative background of some sort. So, mm. we're, um, although most of us have worked in in the tech industry, we also are mostly um, playwrights and novelists and yep. essayists and stuff. And so, we come from a, a background where um, where where we're we have some experience in crafting conversational, but. Funny is actually the third on our list of things we shoot for mm. um, in, in chit chat specifically. Um, first, we're trying to be intelligent um, so that we make it clear that we understood what you said. And second, we want to make we want to be uh, clever or sort of additive or sort of you know bring another layer. And then third, if funny is is appropriate, then we'll try and be funny. Mm. But uh, we only want to be funny within the boundaries of the. Um, the personality that we've crafted for her in a way that supports the sense of trust that we've very, very carefully been trying to build. So, um, for example, <coughs> Clippy was one of the very first, the um, highest volume queries we got early on. Does anybody not know what Clippy is? Everybody know Clippy, right? Okay. <laughs> when, so, when was Clippy removed from uh, from from the Microsoft Office suite? Really, I don't know the date, but yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. And and Still people, remember. you know, so when we started on Cortana, Clippy was uh, a legacy that we had to deal with in yeah. some way. And so we did not want to throw Clippy under the bus. Clippy was, you know. It was this iconic piece of Microsoft Clippy Word. Clippy tried, man. You like, it corner. was not, you know, <laughs> Clippy, you know, did not, people did not go for Clippy, yeah. and there were a lot of really good, we learned, oh my God, we learned so much from Clippy about what not to do. But Cortana doesn't need to hate Clippy, right? Yeah. Like, that's, that's not, so, so when we, when we were looking for ways to sort of address Clippy, we have a couple of other responses that have to do with, like, Clippy's retired and living happily in Boca Raton and, like, <laughs> you know, do, you know, really enjoying shuffleboard. Like, Clippy's fine, you know, we don't, like, we don't need to, so, but if, you know, we could have taken, we could have taken a, like, oh, burn Clippy, you know, Clippy sucks. And, and we didn't want to do that because we are, we are an evolution yeah. of what we learned from that. So that was, um, uh, she's co so confidence is a big one. This was something that I, I, that I personally really championed early on. Um, that she, um, okay, so we always get the question, why is she a she and not a he? Mm. And there are two genders, and you can start with one. So there, there are reasons we went with with uh, a female, but um, but uh, in the end, you know, it's sort of a fifty fifty. But uh, but so okay, so she's a woman. There is a legacy of what women are expected to be like in a in an assistant role, and um, we wanted to be really careful that Cortana not only okay, so she's got a female voice, but she's not a woman. She is an AI assistant, mm -hmm. a digital assistant with a voice that is a female voice. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to be really careful not to have her be subservient in a way that felt um, uh, comp compensate, you know, like we were compensating in some way, or that we would, um, uh, you know, set up a dynamic that we didn't want to perpetuate socially. Mm. And so, um, this is the other thing I, I was excited to talk about today, which is that um, uh, we are in a position to. Uh, to 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 lay the groundwork for what comes after us, right? This is really early stage work. Yeah. Calling it AI is is already um, you know somewhat aspirational, right? So there's there is intelligence behind what's happening here, but um, but the everything is quite a bit on rails. But we get to figure out where we're going with this. So she's a she's an a she's a woman, but she's not um, uh, self deprecating. And uh, and that's easy to do, especially if you want to be funny, and especially if you're responding mm -hmm. to a whole bunch of queries about mm -hmm. Cortana's sex life, which is um, probably a good chunk of the volume of some of the early on queries that we got. Um, it would be it would be easy to capitalize on the humor associated with you know like her being a flirt or her being mm -hmm. you know her her had just come out when we when we when we did this, and we wanted to be really careful. Um, yeah. Do you see, do you see over that. time that her personality would start to adapt to the end user? You know, if somebody doesn't react very well to some of the responses that 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 she um, um, provides, will will she learn that you know people like to be interacted with in a different way? She won't. No, yeah. not that's uh, the the she is who she is, yeah. and um, and we 
Uh, we like to think that she's pretty likable in a general sense and, th- and that she doesn't have too many characteristics that would be off-putting. Mm-hmm. But there are some things where, where we've, we say that we say some stuff that we know not everybody's going to be totally cool with, and we're okay with, you know, she's, if she's, she's like, she's not going to take a stand on Donald Trump specifically or Hillary Clinton, but she is going to say she's pro gay, gay marriage. Like she's not going to, yeah. um, and, and if that's a problem for folks, then they might not respond to Cortana and that yeah. might be a, a, a you know a casualty yeah. for us, but yeah. um, over time, certainly, of course, we're looking for for ways to, for Cortana and and she does now to adapt to your tastes, right? Yeah. And what she um, you know the the things that interest you and the things that you like and the things that you respond to, the things that you do. Yeah. She's she's looking for ways to be helpful to those yeah. specific things, but the way she communicates with you, by and large, is um, is is pretty much how she. Yeah. communicates with everybody. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting to see how this will evolve because um, Cortana runs multi-platforms. It runs on iOS, Android, yes. and um, and uh, desktop computers and laptops, right? Yes. Um, and so in each one of those use cases, people tend to behave fairly differently. So, yes. you know, if you're on your phone, you're probably walking, you might be walking outside in a busy street, you're pretty stressed out, you, you really want to have the response to your query um, and make sure that it's right. Um, you might not have that much time for, for chit-chat or to and fro. Whereas when you're in front of your computer, maybe you're looking for a bit of distraction. And so it'd be, it'd be interesting to see whether in those different contexts, Cortana comes back with um, a dialogue that's either more to the point, um, um, more transactional, or, or one that is a bit more playful. Absolutely. And then there's also optimization for um, the, the mode of communication that you're in, right? Yeah. So if you're on a band, your screen is... That's right. Yeah. Right? You, well, like we could, you know... Cool, I'm AI would barely fit, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you're you're not going to chit chat on a band most likely, but but uh, but we want to be able to walk you through just the full functionality of whatever's available to you mm. on any given device. And so then we're going to carefully think about how much time do you have to listen, how how noisy is it, and how much are, are we going to be able to walk you through a thing, mm. and being able to op- like on the PC, for example. Um, we've been very curious to see how much people are willing to talk to their computers. People yeah. talk to their phone, you know, some, you know, people, yeah. they do. They don't yeah. not necessarily. Yeah. On the PC, when you're yeah. sitting in a, you're in a room, you have a cubicle, yeah. how much are people likely to say, even just say, hey, Cortana, you know, open my calendar or whatever. There's, there's a social, you know, habituation that we have yeah. to pay attention to. Um, People talk a lot to their computers, but um, but we want to make sure that it's as easy and as satisfying to do it by mm. typing on a computer as it would yeah. be for a yeah. voice. And then the output that we give to you, you know, the the way that Cortana responds to you should um, should walk you along in a way that is as easy either way. Yeah. Yeah, and so one of the um, facets of Cortana, I think, is slightly different um, to other digital assistants is this concept of the notebook. Yeah. Um, so do you want to um, tell people in the audience why, why you decided to have this notebook, what it does, and, and what role it has into um, generating an experience that's, that's more sticky and, um, and eventually over time more performant than what you might see with other digital assistants? Totally. Does, by the way, does anybody in here have a Windows phone or use Cortana at all? <laughs> any, who has used Cortana? <laughs> oh, my gosh, like a bunch of you. That's awesome. Okay, cool. So... The um, so the notebook um, is uh, so <clears throat> I mentioned that um, that the um, original architects of Cortana went and and did some interviews with a- actual personal assistants and one thing that was completely um, universal to all of them was that they had some concept of a book that they would carry around that was their bible for their person that they worked with or people and they you know the different ones handled their notebooks in ways that were particular to them and their client but they all had it and so we thought that was a pretty powerful idea and we gave Cortana Cortana's notebook where she keeps the information about you that you've told her and that you can then go interact with. And the idea there is that it's supposed to um, foster this feeling of collaboration between you mm. and Cortana, where uh, where you tell Cortana stuff and it doesn't just get shouted into the void and you hope and pray that someday it will come back to you and you know uh, be valuable in some way, or that you put it in there and you go, oh my God, I'd, 
why why did I say I liked Miley Cyrus? Like, whatever, and, and then you go back, I really need to take that out. That you have that opportunity to go tell Cortana and sort of have have a kind of mission control panel of, mm. of what you want her to know and how you want her to use it. Because, for example, I... Um, like a couple of years ago, um, so I live in Seattle, but I grew up in the Bay Area, so I'm still a Giants fan, and I wanted to track the World Series, and so I would tell Cortana to um, track the Royals for me. And I am not a Royals fan, but I just wanted to know what was going on during the World Series. And then when I, after the World Series was done, I could be like, no, don't, I, hmm. I'm all done with the Royals now, Cortana, thank you very much, and then take it away. And, they, and she doesn't have to like bank that, wait, I thought you liked the Royals, what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah, and then I'm sure there's um, there's this dichotomy between um, what people uh, have in terms of preferences for work and what they have for um, um, for play for their social life. And so, is is there that divide as well in, in the notebook? And, and is there a way that um, users can go in and, and input more of their preferences that they might not have already voiced for specific queries, um, or does it get populated over over time? It it gets popular. It's more additive yeah. um, in terms of um, uh, what your interests are, but. Um, but Cortana is pretty clever about knowing when something's useful to you. And so we just, was it three, four days ago, shipped a thing where, um, where if you uh, let her know that it's okay to take, to keep an eye on your email, she will pay attention to stuff that you've promised to do and sort of resurface it for you and say, um, you know, hey, you, you know, you said to Jonathan's manager, you said to Jonathan that you were going to get back to him on this. Do you want me to remind you? And then she'll give you the option to remind you. Now, she'll, she'll tend to bring that stuff up. You know, she has a sense of when that's useful to you yeah. and how how highly to prioritize it based on other stuff. Yeah. Um, but that's that's um, uh, you know, so we've been talking a lot about personality. My area is is writing her lines and crafting the the sort of pillars of her personality, but. Yeah. It's a good opportunity to mention that we think about her personality in every part of her interaction. So we writers also write what she tells you if she brings up a little card in there that says, you know, hey, you said this to Jonathan, and we want to say it in a way that's both conversational and gets out of your way, yeah. and um, and give you the opportunity, and we give you all the all the little buttons and things to say, you know what, this doesn't interest me, without hopefully the idea is, is mm. saying it so that you don't feel like a jerk for telling her, no, that was mm. wrong, you know, or like, I don't want you to pay attention to that in the future. Mm. Um, and uh, be- because we recognize that one of the, one of the sort of side effects of creating a, a personal relationship is that, it was like, um, I'm sorry, I forgot his name, but the fellow who spoke last? Dennis. Dennis, right, was saying that people write to Amy and say, you know, oh my God, thank you so much, you know, yeah. and, um, uh, that that interaction is part of a natural yeah. communication between uh, certainly between Americans yeah. and, and different yeah. cultures handle those things differently yeah. and um, and so we want to uh, we want to anticipate that social norm and get in front of making sure that you uh, have the opportunity to behave in that way mm. as, as as much as possible. Mm.